Welcome to the Rick Bisson Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so excited to have Dina Bachman here today. Yeah, it's exciting to be here. This is very, it's exciting and it's something I've never done before. So thank you for letting me try something new. Great. That's fabulous. You've tried a lot of new things lately. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to talk about that today. Um, so Dina, um, I'm going to give her a brief bio, but I want to let you know, folks, first that she just ran the Boston Marathon. I part do. of the Dana Farber Challenge team, so we will definitely talk about that. But by way of introduction, Dina is a program manager with McGraw Hill. She was a senior digital content manager at National Geographic Learning, senior production, uh, excuse me, project manager at Teaching dot com, senior production manager, Scrum coach at Story Arc Media. Yes. We might talk a little bit about what a scrum coach is, because <laughs> yes. to me, that's a ball that you run down a field. <laughs> it is. <laughs> All right. Agile technical project manager at Pearson. You have an MBA and you're a scrub master, certified professional and coach. You love a challenge. You're a motivator and a natural leader who can create a creative, cohesive plan to satisfy executive level management developers and users while focusing on the business needs and driving toward enterprise goals. Not an easy task. Different-minded folks. You've built and managed many diverse projects, educational gaming apps, online insurance quoting engines, a comic strip, classroom video recording apps, a graphic novel, and a guided missile destroyer for the U.S. Navy. <laughs> also very diverse groups. You are married to Matt Bachman. You're mother of two smart and vibrant middle school children. You're an active big sister. I am. Yeah. On the education committee at the Rousick, were or are? Were. Were, yeah. yes. Yep. Yeah. And you grew up on a 100-acre farm in Wisconsin. I did. That's really cool. A pig farm. <laughs> a pig farm. Nice. And Boston Marathon runner. Uh, you remember the 2023 Dana-Farber Marathon Challenge, which your team raised a little over, or over six point. Has it reached seven million yet? We hit seven million oh, yesterday. Yeah. Wow, that yes. is phenomenal! And the Dana Farber campaign supports three key campaign priorities: immunotherapy, access to care, and prevention, early detection, and interception. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that. Boston Marathon, Dana Farber Marathon Challenge has raised over $115 million to A date. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah. So let, let's start with the marathon because okay. that that just happened last, really, a week last and a half week. ago? Last week. Last week. Yes. Yeah, it was Monday. Monday last week. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what, well, let's start with this. What decided, what made you decide to run a marathon? I didn't want to run a marathon. Mm. I didn't want to run any marathon. Mm. I wanted to run Boston. Ah. Anytime you live in a city like Boston, for a sh even for a short period of time, we only lived there for, um, I think, five years or something, it just grows on you. It becomes part of you. It's, it's like I always say, Boston will always be my city. No mm. matter where I live, Boston will be my city. And... Living there and watching the marathon, it just sweeps you up. Like, I will say this to anybody. If you ever lose faith in humanity, go watch the Boston Marathon. You can't walk away from there and not be inspired and just see people helping other people and just the feeling is electric and the whole city's behind you. There's a sign right before you cross the finish line that says, um, this race will change you. And it's true. Oh, I'm sure. It's amazing. Yeah. So it, living there, watching the, the marathon, I used to get my coffee and just walk across the street and watch the elites and the wheelchairs. And you, and I just said, I'm going to run this one day. And I just said that for years and years and years. Moved to Maine. I'm, go back on Marathon Monday because I have friends who still run it. Mm. And see the deaf, the Boston Strong Daffodils and like to say, I'm going to run this one day. And then 10 years ago, there was – the awful attack, and I just knew I was going to do it. Just about the timing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's when this year, it was just the right time. I had just 
realized that one, I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> I'm 44. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm 44 years old. Yeah. And I knew I wanted, my only goal was to run it and not do any irreparable damage to my body. Mm. Right. Good goal. And so I just felt like it was the time. And so I just, the only thing that was holding me back, and I shouldn't say the only thing that was holding me back, one of the major reasons is if you don't qualify, you have to raise just a significant amount of money to get in. And the charity since the bombing 10 years ago is very competitive. I had to write an essay. I had to show a financial plan. I had to apply. And then they have to accept you. So, so talk through that different process of the root of being a, a fundraiser for the event or an entrant who earns yep. their way there's, or, or yep. qualifies, there's, I guess. There's only two ways into okay. the marathon. It's capped at 30,000. Okay. Um, the first way is you qualify. And the qualifications are based on age. So, and they are intense. And there are people who qualify that still don't get in because they only take the top qualifiers. Wow. And Boston has become, it's one of the six majors. And it is one of those marathons that it's everybody wants to run. Mm. And so it's competitive to get in. Um, so you can qualify. You can be a fast runner. You have to run a Boston qualifying race. And so, there's only several of those throughout the world. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can run there. You get a bib and then you're able to run on your own. So just for from statistical background, what would you have had to have run? Oh, I have no idea. Do you idea. know? Okay. Didn't even yeah. look. Yeah. Because you immediately – recognize that the route would be for fundraising. I am never, I'm never, I'm about getting to the finish line. I'm not about getting there fast mm. at all. Mm -hmm. You ruined the journey in my mind, right? Like I wanted to, I want to enjoy it. I, you know, and still enjoy my life too, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so qualifying was never for me. Mm -hmm. um, I always knew I was going to run charity. Um my brother and my husband both have ran it for charity. And I have a friend who qualified as well. And so I know what she had to run to get it, and it was not happening. So um, I always knew charity, and I knew it was going to be Dana Farber because I have um, three dear friends who work at the Farber. And I listen to their stories, and I just get it. And um, several of my family has been treated through the Farber. Um, and I have two friends who are on the running team, and I knew what it, the, the price tag was going to be for me to make the team. Mm. So all of that together made it possible to, to do. Okay. And so go back to the what you had to do to be, come or to earn the right to be a fundraising participant, right? Mm -hmm. You had to write an essay, you said? I had to write like a blurb, like why? And I made it short and sweet, mm -hmm. uh, short and sweet. Um, and I made it about my friend Anita, who is the first person that I dedicated the first week of training to. Mm -hmm. um, she lives in Arousic, and she's a breast cancer survivor, and she's also a runner. We, she's my friend, my friend runner. Mm -hmm. And when we, she was getting chemo in the chair, we were like trying. I would do anything to try to distract her. And I said, you know what? At one point, I was like, this is a real crappy way to get into the Boston Marathon because she can run for the Farber as a cancer survivor through the Farber. Mm -hmm. And she laughed and we laughed. And I was like, oh. I go, we're going to do this one day. And I discussed this with her before I applied. I'm like, are we doing this? And she was like, you do this. Don't wait for me. I'm going to run my five year anniversary of Cancer Free. And I was like, and I will be there to support you. So nice. that's why we decided. And so here I sit. I raised over $25,000. You did. I did. You, there's a minimum. There is a minimum. You So the Farber requires that you have a minimum. And then they take your credit card and they say you need to make it by this date. And, so, then and if you don't make it by that date, they, they charge, charge your credit, credit card. card. Yep. So you're going you're gonna to contribute that amount. Yes. And you went well over it. I went well over Three it. Three times over it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, this community is so generous. Mm. People are so generous. People just – people want to feel like they are making an impact. And sometimes they feel like they can't. So when they find an outlet where they can, it makes everybody feel good. Like – what do they say? Like giving a gift, the endorphins mm. are double than receiving a gift. And it's true. Like it wasn't 
I was nervous. This was the part I was nervous about. Like the training I was in control of. I could do that. But like the the fundraising, and it was actually my husband, I love him to death, said he's like, don't even think about that. That is like a no-brainer. He's like, we can do that. And he's actually really good at it. Um, and yeah, he was behind me the whole way. And he's like, don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. And we did Yeah. very easily. That's and amazing. Yeah. That's a huge contribution. Yeah. And what a gift to do that. Yeah. The best part about it, though, is when I had to think about how am I going to raise $20,000, because that was my goal. Uh -huh. How am I going to raise $20,000? I thought about it in two parts. I thought, one, how am I going to motivate myself to run in Maine? Um, I don't know if you know this. It's really hilly here, <laughs> and the roads aren't so great, and I live off of 127. <laughs> yeah. Right, like, it's, it's a thing. Like, how do you motivate yourself to get out there in the weather and all that? And so that's when I was just sitting down one night with Matt, and we were talking about, well, I'm going to dedicate – a week of training to everyone. I'm like, well, there's 22 weeks. And I was like, okay. And I just got out a pen and paper and I was like, do I know 22 people who have been affected by cancer? And it was like my hand just wouldn't stop. Mm. It was like, I, I, it was within less than a minute, I easily had 22 names and more names got added to the list. It, it's, I don't know anybody. I don't know if anybody can honestly say they don't know anybody either within their inner circle or within their reach that, or in their orbit that hasn't been affected by cancer. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I didn't get through all 22 names, but your mom. My mom. Your Uncle Dan. Yes. My Amazing. godfather. Your godfather. My, um, my grandmothers, both of them. Um, the list is long. Like local local folks too, Keith Longbottom mm -hmm. from Five Islands yeah, sure. and the Longbottom family. Yeah. Um, and what, what, how, what kind of inspiration you have given to them? That's what, when I look at this, so I'm watching through Facebook, basically, and seeing your progress, and I'm inspired. I'm not running the marathon. I'm not raising the money, but, and I just saw so much encouragement coming from other people towards you, and, you know, to see somebody like Gina Longbottom, you know, jumping in there and giving encouragement was just phenomenal. Well, there's, there's those little moments, so, like... There's the moment where I ran um, for I ran for Megan and Megan Rogers um, passed away um, in college and she went to Woolwich and she went to Morse Megan, and sure, yeah. yeah and to hear her friends talk about her I, it was so intimate and I was so grateful to be a part of the process and afterwards the feelings that came out were. Thank you for letting us talk about her. She's not forgotten, right? And when th there's like um, Kate Chipman, this is another great story. So she survived lung cancer. And years and years later, she's at a softball game in town. And there is a mother whose daughter is battling cancer. And Kate walked up to her and said, I know what you're going through. It's going to be okay. I'm praying for you. And that woman then commented on my Facebook page and said, I remember that. I needed it. It was exactly what I needed at that moment. And it's just so, I just got all this. It was, it was hard work listening to all the stories and appreciating it and retelling them in a way that honors the individual and the story. But it was so worth it. I think it was worth it for me, and it was worth it for anybody who got to listen. And a lot of them are my family members. Um, my aunt survived 47 years of cancer. Wow. Like, there's just, it's it was inspirational for me. And so when I had to, you know, go out and run a long run, I thought of, I could just pick someone out of out of my list on the back of my shirt pick someone and think about that person. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what they did was really hard. I can do hard things. The, my, um, my yoga instructor, Courtney at Ebb and Flow in town, she always says, um, what does she say? She says something about be grateful that your body can do what it's doing in a place like this. She probably says it more eloquently than I do. But it's true. My body can run in Maine. It's gorgeous, right? You're on these beautiful roads. 
running past your neighbors. They say hi to you. It's the dream, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I should recognize that and enjoy every moment of mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So these 22 plus people that you're running for, they're, they're motivating you and they're carrying you through. So I guess I should ask this question I meant to earlier. Running background? Do you have a running background? No. No. Okay. No. Okay. No. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do this. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Absolutely. Yeah. No. No. Good for you. No. Yes. Yeah. No. no. And and you know you're in Maine, so you're training for the Boston Marathon, which means you're running in the winter, mm-hmm. right? It was a very nice winter to it train for the Boston good, Marathon. You're right. It, it was. was a great yeah. winter. Mm-hmm. I have no complaints there. Um, I ran in the coldest. I ran was in Wisconsin. I was visiting my parents. Oh, it was number double digits below. And my eyelashes were frozen shut. I had to like rub them to open them back up. Mm. That was probably the coldest run. Um, my warmest run was probably I ran in um, Kyoto, Japan. I had a twenty miler there, and I, hot and humid. It was over seventy degrees and humid. And it was in a country that I don't speak the language or read the language. Mm. And oh, <laughs> how do you know where you're going? 20 miles? Well, you know, this is where there's there's always helpers, mm. right? So at the hotel, I explained what I was doing and we got out like a map and we just was I was just talking to people who worked at the hotel and I was like, "Listen, this is what I need to do." I had to convert the miles to kilometers and then they were like, "Wait, what? You're running that?" And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah." <laughs> True story. True story. That's pretty cool. True story. Cool. I'm, running, I'm running that. Sorry. But yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So that, that's a lot of emotion to carry through your training as I well. I cried right? a lot. I'm yeah. a crier. Yeah. I, well, well, I think we're probably going to be a lot of tears today. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. I cry a lot. Yeah. I cry a lot. And it's good. I I, I don't hide it. You it give me a commercial and I'm crying. So this <laughs> specifically brought a lot of, of tears to my eyes in, in many good ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you had people that would run with you. I did. Right? Yeah. Oh, I had I had a great support crew from the beginning to the end. Like I have um, a good group of girlfriend runners that we run usually just for medals. We find like a cool medal and then we'll make a girls weekend out of it and we'll just run. So like they were inspiring from the beginning. And then I set myself up with a running coach, a virtual running coach in Philadelphia. And when I first met her, I was like, listen, I'm 44. I have two kids, full-time job. um, And my goal is just to finish and not be broken. And I was like, and I want to enjoy myself after the marathon. I want to have a beer. And she was like, no problem. And she was amazing. So she set my training plan up from the very beginning. And it turned out to be over 600 miles in six months. I ran wow. in prep for this. Yeah. And she was the person that I needed to talk to. Like if I felt, I just did whatever she said. And then when I got to a point where I was like, I don't know if I can do this 20 mile run in Japan. And she was like, oh, we'll adjust everything else but you're doing your 20 miles. And I needed that hard (laughs) love to be like, yes, Dina, you can do this. Like you've built up to this. So then, yeah, I had a training coach and then I had my family and my friends. I mean, it takes a lot. Like my husband stepped up and took the kids places because I had a long run, Mm -hmm. right? And you know, my friends, like Beth Shipley was like, oh, I'll run 10 miles with you. And I was like, really? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I learned that I loved running with friends, mm. right? And it was just, they're my cheer squad. Like my nephew, I got to run with my nephew. Mm. And you don't get those moments like that one-on-one time very often. Mm-hmm. And when I was in Wisconsin, I had to run 18 miles. And I ran the first eight by myself. And then it came back to the house, picked up my nephew, started running the second eight with him. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, we see my dad driving by. And we're like, what is he doing? And then he turns around and honks and like drives away. And we're like, what's going on? All of a sudden, we see in the distance, we see a Boston Marathon jacket. And I'm like, is that a marathon jacket? And Eric, my nephew, goes, I think that's my dad. Then my brother joined us for the last few miles home. And it was just magical. And then my dad jumps out and starts snapping photos of us. It's just, 
those are moments you can't you mm. can't script or plan. Mm. They just magically happen, mm -hmm. and those are the ones that I'm. Those are like the highlights, highlights. right? Those yeah. are the highlight reels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, mm -hmm. how do you the schedule? The coach obviously gave you the uh, the model that you needed to work on. Mm -hmm. Implementing it though, what was that like? How, how did you do that? Because it. From a time perspective, you starting out, you're going to build, mm -hmm. you're in the crux of it at yeah. some point in time. And how do you work that into your day? I like the motto that says, um, you know, everybody says they don't have time. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for that. Um, you, everybody has the same amount of time. It's about what you prioritize, right? Like if you... If you prioritize something, if you want something to happen, you'll make it happen. If you don't, you'll make an excuse. And there is time in the day to do all grand and wonderful things. Did I stop doing some things? Oh, yeah, I did. Did I stop cleaning the house? You better believe it. Did I stop doing things? Like, I love making things like home improvement projects. Have I touched anything of my any of my other hobbies? No, I didn't. But you had a great reason to pause those. But I paused them, and you better believe this past weekend I made a whole bunch of shelves in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the miter saw was going zoom zoom zoom. Because you knew at the end of I this knew that those that was your next my, project. My next project, yeah. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, yeah, so you wake up in the morning. You look at your work calendar. You look at your family calendar. We're very digital in my house. Mm. We have a smart board with everybody's schedule on it in the mudroom. I might work like we patch it together. Matt was awesome. I was like, "Hey, I gotta run five. I gotta run three. When are you gonna do your run?" And then he'd be like, um, "You were supposed to leave for your run." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know." He's like, "Yeah, kind of gotta go for your run." Mm. And I was like, "Okay." And I had my dog who did the majority of all my training with me. Really? Yes. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. Yeah. So I had a running, I always had a running buddy with him. He would see me put on my jacket and he'd start like bouncing up and do down to get out the door. Mm. So. What was your favorite running route? Oh, my favorite running route? It's Bald Head Road in Arousic. Mm. Just because I know it like the back of my yeah. hand. Yeah. And, it, and there's no traffic. And there's no traffic. Yeah. Only mm. when it's not muddy. <laughs> How many miles can you get out of Bald Head? Oh, I can get a lot because <laughs> I run, I can easily get seven miles just on Bald Head Road mm. by running up and down my neighbor's driveways. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. I can run to the end of the road and back, and then I can run down one neighbor's driveway and back, and that's two miles, and I've never left a half a mile from my house. Then I'd run down my other neighbor's driveway. That gave me another quarter of a mile. And then I'd run to the end of the road and I'd go up all these little side roads. I, at one point, I thought my neighborhood thinks I'm nuts because here I am just wearing this blaze orange jacket and I have a black lab with me and just running, running around. Making it happen. Making it happen. Wow. How did that relate when you got, so did you do any races prior? No. No. I've done races before in the past. Okay. In 2019 is when I really started running, and I ran a race every month for a year. And I every month for a year. Every, every month for a you year. You ran a race. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, one of them was like the Shamrock Sprint in Bath, 5K. Yeah. And so I got. I I like New Year's resolutions. I like goals. I'm a goal setter. Like I will set a goal and I will do it. Mm. And. The marathon was one of them. I said, I'm going to run the Boston Marathon, and I'm going to work towards it. When did you set that goal for the Boston Marathon? Oh, that's a great question. Um, years before or, or that, that year? Years. I said okay. it. I knew I was going to run the Boston Marathon probably 2005. I knew I was going to run it. I think I finally pulled the trigger when – was this past year when I was like, I'm going to run it this year. I think I felt like I'm going to do it. Kids are at a great age. Mm -hmm. They're very self-sufficient. I have great kids. I just think about the influence you've had on these kids, your kids and other, and their friends' kids. You know, your mom ran a marathon, you know, and then they can tell their story about their involvement in the marathon. You know, and as I was writing my mom's post, I realized my mom ran a half marathon in her 50s. Mm. Like, I'm emulating her life. She mimicked what it's like in life that, you know, to 
do new things and, you know, say yes to things. And now I realize that I'm doing that as well. And my daughter wrote me the most amazing thing before the marathon and I just cherish it. And it's, you know, all the notes that I've gotten and personal messages, it was just, I, I, I feel good about it. Like mm. you can do, you can do hard things. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your kids are obviously exposed to goal setting them, I would say, <laughs> around the house. <laughs> I'm getting that directly from you. I'm sure Matt is very similarly minded. Yes, yes. we are. <laughs> well, there'll be great things to, to come in the world from the, the Backman, <laughs> for sure. Um, so physically, mentally, tell us about the training and then... Yeah, let's just talk about the training, the physically and mental part of it. You, you, did you survive without injury? Did you have injuries throughout the process? I did it pretty much without injury. Mm. I have this, I have a, a goal board in my office, like a vision board. And on it, it says, identify it, treat it, make sure it never comes back. So I know I have plantar fasciitis. I know I have arthritis. I have early onset arthritis. I know I have all these things. So... I'm going to identify it. That was stage one. Treat it and if it ever come back. Um, Riverview Physical Therapy in Bath knows me very well. Mm. I have been there weekly during this entire time. And every week I'd walk in and they'd be like, hey, Dina, how's the training? How you doing? What's going on? I'll be like, well, this knee, this foot, this, this. You know, it's, it's, it's about the effort, right? I know I have things that I need to overcome in order to, to to run this. So I just scheduled it in, made a plan, like went and got new shoes, right? Talked to my coach about it and said things. And like, so physically, I was on top of it, right? Like I didn't let anything get me down. Um, like toenails fall off when you train for a marathon. I don't know if people know this, but this is a legit thing. Really? Right? But there's solutions for this. My friend Anita for Hanukkah gave me these little toe guards that saved my toes and then none of my toenails fell off for the rest of the training. So it's just, there's all these little things that you can adjust and mm. work through. Mentally, I listen to a lot of books. To the dismay of some people, they were like, what are you doing? I listened to a ton of books. Why was it the dismay of other people? That because um, my friend Hank tells me you have to you have to listen to your body while you run. Oh. And I'm running on 127 and there's there's traffic and I should be listening. Oh. But no, I, there's more than one time that I've been running, listening to a book and I will stop and be like, did anybody hear that? Did you just catch that plot twist? <laughs> I overran a couple of times. I was supposed to turn around. Really? But the book was so good that all of a sudden I looked at my watch and I was like, ah! And I would turn around and run in the other mm, direction. Mm. It's, yeah. a, it's a great mental distraction. Yeah. Were you reading fiction, nonfiction? Everything. Everything. Anything? Everything. I read a lot of books. Yeah, I do. You? So I read, yeah. So I am. Can you tell us a favorite one that came out of your marathon? Or if there's more than one, one that's that okay. One that I remember. Well, I remember a bunch. But the one that definitely I remember is David Goggins, who's a Navy SEAL, mm -hmm. who wrote Can't Hurt Me. Mm -hmm. And he ran a marathon on two broken legs. And... He, I don't agree with all of his, his words that he says, but that's true with a lot of things in life. Yes. You take the nuggets mm -hmm. that are meaningful, right? And from there, I took a lot of nuggets mm. of like working through like callousing your brain. He uses that term a lot. Um, and just listening to his story and what he accomplished was just inspiring as well. So I still remember the point of when... Uh, I can remember points of like on the route and things he said mm. and like powering me through. I ran my fastest training run listening to that book, actually. Really? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Um, have you read The Iron Cowboy? Are you familiar with The Iron Cowboy? I have it. He ran 50 marathons, one in each state in 50 weeks. Oh, my goodness. And I think he's done something beyond then as well. So sometime it might be a fun read oh, I'll look or it listen. So. I will add it to my list. Add it to your list. Add yes. Um, okay, so let's let's get to Boston. Yeah. Um, I, I'm amazed. At, well, I guess first before we do that, I'd love to say that you getting this done was because you let people into the experience and they helped you and you sought out help. We're so wired, I think, as people to do it all on our own. Mm -hmm. I got this. I got this covered. Um, and sometimes people will do that. They'll they'll research 
information, but it'll be all internal. They'll do it all on their own. I think when we seek out others, they can give us that tough love that we wouldn't have otherwise. You know, Absolutely. when it's time to do that 20 miles. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you can go ahead and do this, but you can do the 20 miles. Yep. Yeah. My 22-miler, I ran from my house to from Arousic to Reed State Park and back. So it's 10 miles from my driveway to Reed. And uh, Matt ran. He So Matt had ran the Boston Marathon before. And he said to me, he goes, if you can run the Georgetown Store Hill, you can run Heartbreak Hill. And that's he, a the, the the heartbreak hill. I don't know that one, but I know the Georgetown. Georgetown Story hill. hill is worse. <laughs> yeah, I will say that it is. Yeah. Yep. And Matt met me at the bottom of the hill, and we he ran it with me mm, and nice. carried me up. And it's exactly true because if no one was watching, I probably would have walked. Mm. But the fact that I had, you know, Matt with me running, and I had a girlfriend of mine, Christine, in the car. Snapping photos <laughs> of us, right? <clears throat> like it does. Mm. It holds you accountable, mm. and it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. So, um, you arrived at Boston. What what what's that arrival scene look like? I mean, because I got to admit, I mean, I that's not on my bucket list. It is for some, not many. But can you give us that experience from your perspective? It was the t it's the ten year anniversary of the bombing, and I think. That brought a different level to the event than would you would previously. You could sense that from watching it, from, from media, you could see the difference. Everything, the people, the pride, the, the presence, right? Everything, you felt it, you felt it. Um, I had just went to Tokyo to watch the Tokyo Marathon. My friend ran the Tokyo Marathon. And when you went to Tokyo, you didn't know there was a marathon happening. I rolled into Boston on Saturday morning you knew there was a marathon. The whole city is decorated in blue and gold marathon colors. There are unicorns everywhere. Um, there's banners, there's posters. The Boston Marathon is the only one of the major marathons that has a permanent finish line. So anyone at any time can go down on Boylston Street and touch the finish line of the Boston Marathon. It's like for the people, you can do it. Um, they erected like the stadium and the the bleachers and like the above um, the Monday before, and they allow you to cross the finish line and to walk down Boylston Street. So we we get there and we go to the expo and get all your stuff, um, and then we exit the Heinz Convention Center and you are facing down Boylston and you just see people, hundreds of people, and. You just walk and you're walking the, the, the final steps of the Boston Marathon. My mom was with me and she started like fake running. I'm like, mom, you're running the Boston Marathon, right? <laughs> and, you know, I, um, as a charity runner, I highly recommend it. I felt like I was taken very good care of by Dana Farber. I had like, um, I met a, an Olympic gold medalist. They had they had all these opportunities for us, right? Um, they had um, like a, like I'll get into like the dinner and everything, but I had a different experience because I was a charity runner. I felt really taken care of. Um, it was very well planned out for me. I didn't have to figure things out. They told me this is what you do here and when, and it, it took the thought out of it. Um, but we we went to Boston on Saturday, which was the actual day, the 15th, was the 10-year anniversary of the bombing. Okay. And people, we were walking the streets, and there's two memorials on Boylston Street where each one of the bombs went off. And there's pillars there, like blue pillars. And we stopped. And to be honest, I cried. It was emotional. Mm. They, had, um, they had guards there like in respect and they had flowers and, but people were emotional. Like people understood what happened there. And there was, there's also this feeling of like, not, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not like people, I know, and maybe I shouldn't speak for people. I will speak for myself. I felt like we've risen back better, right? Like you tried. You failed. We're still here. We're still running. I, I like every time 
I, I pass it. I always say the sign of a cross, and I think of them. And I did so as I crossed the finish line, as did I you? ran the race. Nice. I did the same thing, nice. just you know, to to honor the moment, but then also to say, we still run. We're still mm. running, and we will continue to run. It's just like that perseverance. I can't think of the right word, but it w- it was humbling, yeah. and uh, you know, it was very humbling, and I appreciated being able to be there. Mm. A lot of grit. <sighs> A lot of grit. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. So then you have, there's events all over the city. They have like pop-up tents and there's like things going on. Um, One of my favorite moments was we, so, so, so then Sunday, right? The day before the marathon, we decide, well, I don't want to do a lot of walking, but I don't want to stay in the hotel all day. So we were like, let's go to Boston Common and let's look. There's two things I wanted to see in Boston Common. I wanted to see the Make Way for Duckling statue because they decorate <laughs> them as runners. Oh, really? <laughs> they put little shoes and little marathon medals on them. And then the other thing I wanted to see was the survivor tree. So um, Boston, so after 9-11, there was one tree that survived from the 9-11 site. And during the rumble, they found a green leaf and they extracted the tree, took it to Brooklyn and rehabilitated this tree and they brought it back to life. And so now at the at Ground Zero and the memorial, they put, a, they put the tree back in this special place. And every year they donated seedlings to cities and towns affected by tragedy. Wow. And Boston got one of the first seedlings. Hmm. I just learned this in a book, um, actually, at the Woolwich Library. Very it nice. Won the Chickadee Award. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to see the tree, and so we went to go. We went to the Boston Common, and we park underneath it, and we all of a sudden see this crowd of people, and we're like, "What is going on?" And we come up to the top, and there are hundreds of golden retrievers, hundreds with these yellow Boston Marathon, Boston Strong. Uh, handkerchiefs around their necks and you could just go up and they're golden retrievers and you're just like petting them and they're rolling on their back (laughs) and they're licking you and there's just hundreds of them and then I realize I ask them when I go is this because of Spencer and they go yep so Spencer was the golden retriever that's um, famous for holding a Boston Strong flag in his mouth at like early on in the marathon. And he would just stand there like, you know, with the flag out and people would pet him. And he became the official dog of the Boston Marathon. And he unfortunately passed two months ago. So this was all because of one dog. Hundreds of people show up, hundreds of, of golden retrievers. There was not there wasn't one person who wasn't smiling. I mean, how can you not smile? <laughs> and I was like, can you bring these dogs to the start line? Like, who doesn't want a quick, like, rub yeah. down right before <laughs> you can go and run and get in the right frame of mind? Mm. So, and I actually said to the kids, I go, look at what one dog can do. Imagine what one, what one human can do, mm. right? Like, it was, that was one of my favorite moments, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, again, was very lucky because I have friends that live like two blocks from the finish line. So my race day experience was very, very, um, very easy, Mm. right? Like the night before we had a uh, dinner with Dana Farber where they invite all the runners to have and they give us like, you know, that we just just celebrate and um, we meet some patients and um, there were multiple people currently receiving cancer treatment running for the Dana-Farber team. Really? Inspiring. How I, many Dana-Farber? 500. 500. I think it was just shy of 500 this year. It's the largest charity team in the Boston Marathon. And um, the one someone said, what you did to get here, what, what, what you had to do to get to the start line is, is harder than what it will take to get you to the finish. Basically, you already did the hard work. Yeah. Now enjoy it. And it's true. And at that point, it was just so – it was just it was just like celebratory and, and fun. And like the stress just kind of went away. I, I was ready. Mm. And so the morning of the marathon, I slept at my friend's house and he walked me to the hotel, the four blocks. I met up with the team and um, – 
the last one of the last words that were said to the team before we left was um, two time marathon winner. What is her name? Joan Benoit Joan Samuelson. Benoit Samuelson. She was there. She was. She gave us our last words wow. before we got on the buses, mm. and it was just. I met a friend named Ken. This was his ninth year running for Boston, running Boston for Dana Farber. He's raised over a hundred thousand dollars, and he's sixty nine years old. Wow. He started after the bombing because he was inspired. He wanted to do something. Mm -hmm. So this was his ninth time. I'm like, this is my first. And I was like, do you want to be friends? He's like, let's be <laughs> friends. And we ran the first 23 miles together. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 69. And Amazing. So, so he, he, how many has he done now? Did you say? This was his ninth. His ninth. So he'll so do he his 10th. started at 60. Yep. He'll do so, his 10th on his 70th. It's not too late. Yeah. Yeah. It's never, it's never too late. <laughs> wow. Okay. So... You're at the start line. Well, so first you've got to get to the start line. There are 500 school buses waiting for you to go to the start line because it's point to point. It's one of the only of the majors that's point to point. Not a loop, you mean? Not a loop. So all the runners <clears throat> meet, well, all the non-elite runners meet in Boston Common. And it's so well organized. I just felt so taken care of the entire time. At no point did I ever feel that there were 30,000 of us because it was just so, it, it, it was so easy, right? We all get in line to get on the buses in Boston Common and they're just bringing bus after bus after Are bus. Are you staged by? You're staged by wave. Okay. And all the charity runners are in wave four. Um, and they're all color coded, which I appreciate for accessibility. And like, it, it just makes sense. Hmm. And an, one of the moments that sticks out is, so there are thousands of runners in Boston Common and there's one gate into the buses. And so we're all trying to, you know, it's a large crowd. We're all moving. And w at one point they needed to move the buses. And one person uh, with a microphone said, stop. And everybody stopped. Hmm. And it's been a really long time where I have had a group of people just be mindful and open to listening, like to listen to someone, to make that many people stop with one voice. And everybody just stopped and looked around. And we were like, I can't believe everybody just stopped. <laughs> Do I really feel that bad about humanity that I think people are still going to push? No one did. Hmm. And I was like, huh, all right. And then he was like, go. And then we just kept on moving again. Hmm. So then you take a bus. People are cheering the buses on. People on the road are like screaming in the bus windows, you got this, flatten the hills. There's 500 buses and people are cheering buses. So you make your way down the Mass Pike. People are honking at you and you get to Athletes Village and it's just so well planned. The bus drops you off. I was a charity runner, so I get access to indoor space. And there was like a huge downpour that came through. Mm -hmm. I stayed dry because I was with my team in the cafeteria. And we just, we were like, oh, you ready to go? Okay, let's go. Our wave's ready. We just started walking to the start line. It was like nothing. It was so not stressful. Mm -hmm. But I also think I didn't make it stressful. Mm -hmm. Like I wasn't in it to win it, right? So we got to the start line and then they were like, okay, start running. Like. Okay. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so we started and I had Ken and Ken and I were a team, literally just met each other and we were already on a team. And he said, um, I'll watch time. You watch fuel, nutrition, because one of the biggest mistakes and everybody said is the first 10 miles is downhill and you can't, and you're so excited. You're in a race. You usually go above your race pace and you're going to burn your quads. You need to pick a pace and stick, stick with it. And everybody's like, you're never going to be able to do it. You're going to want to run fast. Nope. I had Ken. So Ken and I, we set our pace and we ran. And every 30 minutes, I'd be like five minutes to fuel, time to fuel. We'd eat something and just go. And we did that for the first 23 miles together. Mm -hmm. And it was nice to have someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, experience it. You are just wrapped up in like awesomeness all around you. So like at one point I was running next to, next to someone on double blades, right? On double blades? Double blades. You the, mean, you talking about roller skate blades? No, I mean no. like blades, like they're an amputee. Oh, they oh, have oh, double sorry. blades. Uh, excuse me. And wow. like running blades. Okay. And you're just like, Wow. 
And the next thing you know, you're running down and you see someone with a really funny sign and you find yourself like openly laughing. <laughs> and then you're running a little bit further and you, someone's handing out oranges. One person was handing out lobster rolls. Like they were handing out all these things and just everybody's cheering for you. And um, then you f see people that you know and I had such a great support. I... The, the moments that I look back on fondly was just amazing. Like mile 10, my entire crew, it was a big crew, got out, took the commuter rail out and met me at mile 10. And they were screaming and cheering. Um, one of the people I ran for, Carol, who has passed away, her daughter was there and Carol's drink was fireball. So at mile 10, her you daughter fireball? her daughter and I took a fireball shot at mile 10. And I like whipped it down and gave it to her. And like, <laughs> I was there to experience it all. It was awesome. Um, my brother brought a Falco jersey from the movie The Replacement, Shane Falco. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's a oh, line yeah, in there yeah. about, you know, pain and all that. And I just knew. I just looked at my crowd and I knew that. It, it got you through. And after I ran away a little bit, someone in the race said to me, are you famous? And I was like, <laughs> yes, I am. Yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's um, cool. One moment too was you just never know when something amazing is going to happen. Like all of a sudden you look ahead and you see this beautiful balloon arch. And I'm like, I'm running through that balloon arch. And I find out later that it's in honor of a cancer patient who passed away. Right? There's all these little things. And one time I was running and all of a sudden I heard like this uproar. And I had this man running next to me and he was wearing like some sort of a logo. And then I saw that this logo was set up and they, at this point you could still get into the race, like fans, you could hug fans. You get to a point where they're barricading you in, where you can't touch the crowd. But this was a point where the crowd could still like interact Engaged. with okay, you. Yep, yeah. Yep. And this group of men just come out of nowhere and they're just like, yeah. They're like in front of him, behind, and he was walking before he saw them. And they were like in front of him, behind him. They had noisemakers. They had confetti guns. They just like swooped him up. It was like literally he was floating. And they just carried him for a little bit. And they were like, you got this. We'll see you at the finish line. And then he just kept on running. And I was like, what was that? That was amazing. It was all those mm, moments mm. that just those little ones along the way that, you know, it's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So you you can interact with public, and then all of a sudden you come to a barricaded section. And what what why, what drives that change in the interaction? That's a good question. So there was so to touch on security mm -hmm. for a moment, it was obvious from the start there was a heightened security. I don't know if this was because it's the ten year anniversary or if this is the new norm, but. There was presence felt at every moment, even on the Saturday before when we walked down the Boylston Street for the first time, there was a helicopter that was hovering down Boylston Street so low, but it had radio, like it had some sort of sonar that could detect things. Like you knew the manhole covers were all stamped because they checked all the manhole covers of the race route. There was military police always an eye line in distance. Um, I saw snipers on rooftops. Like every cross street either had a New England snowplow or two buses or a concrete truck. Like they left nothing to chance. Um, I felt secure and safe the entire race. Like at no point did I ever feel for my safety. Um, so with that being said, they have, they have a strict policy on renegade runners. So pre-bombing, they allowed anybody to run the Boston Marathon. You just didn't get a medal or any end of race support if you didn't have a bib. They have shut that down now. Mm. They are very strict about renegade runners. Um, so as you're farther out in the neighborhoods, there's really no barricades. I mean, there's enough to like, you know, give space. But then as you get closer into the city, I would say right at Kenmore Square, that's when it starts to double barricade, and especially down Boylston Street. That um, There was barricades up to Boylston Street, and then in Boyle Street itself, there was double barricades. So there was space between the crowd and the runners. Um, yeah, and it's, it's, it's an unfortunate outcome 
of what has happened in the past, but it goes back to we're still running. Mm. We're still running. Yeah. Were were there milestones in the marathon that stick out to you in terms of either endurance or mental or physical or spiritual experiences that you had? I remember crossing the space where I used to drink my coffee when I used to watch the elites go by. I took a moment there. Um, I definitely took a moment as I'm coming over the um, an overpass. It's like mile 25. And I, my feet, I was like, hmm, should I take a look to see what's going on or should I just run? So I decided to look. So I took my shoes and socks off. And it was like a low point in the race. There was no, we were going over an overpass, so there was no spectator. So I like leaned on there and took my shoes off, kind of assessed the situation. I was like, hmm, okay, I'm just going to keep running. So I put my shoes and socks back on and I was feeling it at that moment. And I crest over the hill and then I see my name. It says Dina Bachman. And I'm like, and I didn't recognize the person holding the sign. I was like, who is that? And then I got closer and I saw my friend Sarah. And then I saw my friend Taylor running across and I'm like, oh. They were exactly what I needed at that moment to like forget about the feet, focus on the race and go. And then just not even a little farther ahead, my support crew was there again, right on the turn. There's this famous saying, they say right on Hereford, left on Boylston. That is the last two turns before the finish line. Mm. And my support crew was on Hereford Street. And a stranger took a video of my crowd and after I left, he tapped my husband and said, you're going to want this. Really? I videoed this. What's your number? Let me give you this video. And it's, you know, I'm crying. People are crying. I'm taking selfies. Like, Is that the video you posted? Yes, it yeah, is. It was, video. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome. It was. It is awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's great. We live in a world where we have technology, where we can rewind these moments. <laughs> And see them from different perspectives because when you see it in first person, you miss all the stuff going around. Like, and now that I can see how other people saw it, it's it, it helps. It's I have an awful memory; I can't remember things, so I either have to write it down or take a picture of it. And so now this is one of these ways that I can remember this for always. Yeah, is there a contrast between or or a similarity between the first mile of the marathon and the last? Oh yeah, one point two miles. Oh, yeah. Is that right? 1.2 miles? Humans. Yeah. The amount of humans. <clears throat> when you turn on a Boylston Street, you have sky. You have large buildings on both sides of you. You have hundreds of fans, like hundreds of people cheering you on. It's loud. They have inspirational banners on all the buildings. Um, it's You can see the finish line, and you just... It's like nothing you can ever experience. Everybody, when I was on the team, I was saying, oh, how many of you run? I'm going, oh, this is my first time. And they were like, I'm so jealous. There is nothing like the first time of turning on Boylston Street. You just don't experience it ever like that again. And it's true. You just feel the, just feel the energy and you're like, wow, I just did this. And just short of the finish line, I had my a college roommate of mine came with her family and she screamed my name and I was like, hey. And I was like, thank you so much for coming. And she was like, the finish, go, the finish line is right there, run. I was like, it'll be there when I get there. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. <laughs> she clearly hadn't been where you had been <laughs> be before or at that moment. <laughs> but when I crossed one of the, I would listen to a podcast about the Boston Marathon right before. And in it, there's this podcaster called Allie on the Run. And she does the announcing at the finish line. And in the podcast, she says, I'm going to apologize ahead of time if I don't say your name when you cross the finish line, because it's just the names are just scrolling really, really, really fast. And I thought to myself, oh, it'd be so cool if she said my name. So as I crossed the finish line, all of a sudden I hear her voice yell, Dina Bachman, you just finished the Boston Marathon. <laughs> and I went, <laughs> and then cried. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you, what happens when you finish? You finish? You it gets line. such a well-planned race. It's so well-planned. You cross the finish line and you were just like walking and there's all these wonderful 10,000 volunteers, 10,000. And all these wonderful volunteers at the end of the finish line are like, congratulations. 
And what they're really doing is they're med checking you. Mm -hmm. They're engaging with you to see how you're feeling. And I'm just like, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'm just (laughs) thanking all these people. And they're like, okay. I go, what do I do now? They're like, just keep on walking down the chute. You'll have food and water and your metal and your space. And it's true. You just keep on walking. It's kind of like a car wash where they like first check you to make sure you're okay. And then you go into the next thing and then they give you hand you a water bottle and then they hand you your your blanket and then one person is there just to tie your blanket for you so you don't even have to tie your own thermal blanket then there's a person with the metal and then they give you snacks and more water and I was just felt like so well taken care of and then to the point when you get to the end of the shoot all the buses are there with um, anybody who has gear check, anybody who left anything. Or if you're a charity runner, you're taken to your charity runner spot. And I'd, I wanted to go to my friend's place because my, my whole crew was there. And there was a volunteer right at the gate. She looked at me. She goes, would you like to get out? I go, I would love that. Here, let me move this for you. And she just moved it. And I left. She goes, congratulations. And I, at that point, that's when I like broke down. This one volunteer got like all my thankfulness <laughs> from all the other 10,000 volunteers I saw. And I just like started gushing to her. I was like, you guys are amazing. <laughs> you were so helpful from the very beginning. Thank you so much for volunteering your time. And I just like unloaded on her. And then I was like, okay, I got to go now. And I just started <laughs> the, the walking. The emotional dive. I just started walking yeah, away. continue. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The rumor is is though people tried to get into med tents for years to volunteer and there's a wait list. So many people want a piece of this marathon mm. that they will be on a wait list to volunteer. Mm. It's phenomenal. So w- what is your body telling you? You've just, I mean, your the chemical composition of your body has just been probably at a place you've probably never been before, let's say, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe not. What, what's it telling you now? I'm actually okay. Hmm. I'm okay. I'm I, I I'm okay. And I got to meet as soon as I left the barricade. I knew where um, my husband and my two kids were going to be waiting for me, and that was a great moment too. Like just seeing them. I was taking pictures of my medal in the trees, and then all of a sudden I look and I hear and I see Dina. I was like, oh hey, <laughs> and I finished <laughs> taking my picture, and then I just walk over to them and I'm like, hey. And my kids gave me the biggest bear hug ever. And then we just got like in this group hug. And then me and my husband just held hands and we just walked to my friend's apartment. And I I felt good. Like, I mean, I have arthritis. So like, you have those feels. I had all the feels, right? But there was nothing to stop me from walking. I knew that I had a house full of people waiting to see me. Um, You know, I just followed my regular race routine. Like, I had a shot, another shot of fireball. (laughs) <laughs> glass of champagne, an ice bath, and then I was ready to roll. Mm. And I said, I contribute this to my coach too. Like I was, my body was ready for this a hundred percent. And I felt fine the next day, you know, I'm, wow, I'm feeling good. You didn't sleep for 24, 36 hours. I mean. No, I actually stayed up until like midnight. I think I had a couple more fireball shots. <laughs> My girlfriend actually sent me a video of it, and she goes, "I." One of the girl, one of my friends said, did you rip a fireball shot at mile 10? I go, yeah. And then my girlfriend sent me a video of me drinking another one later at night. I go, oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> but I felt great. Mm. It's just- You were prepared. I was mentally, like, even physically prepared for this, and- one of my friends flew out from Ohio, and she actually turned all my stories, my Facebook posts, into a book. Oh, what a oh, gift. What a gift. Um, my father-in-law gave me his medal from the St. Louis Marathon. He qualified for Boston twice and never ran it. And he said, me running it felt like he ran it. And I actually trained with him, too. Him and I did a little training 30-minute training together too. Cool. Um, people were just, it was, I, they all had these weird bad faces of me at dinner. So when I came, the whole table of people, there was like 20 some people at dinner. They all had like this silly looking face of me oh. on. <laughs> I felt loved. I felt loved <laughs> from soup to nuts. Wow. Huh. Did you, were you around or did you see any of the elite runners this time? Probably not. I did not. Mm-hmm. I did not. Mm-hmm. 
they uh, they get their own private buses. They stay at their own hotel. But one thing I heard they do new this year is before they kept the elite runners separate from the rest of the runners. But now they have them march through. They have like this alley apparently. I don't know. I didn't see it. Um, but the elite runners will walk through the crowd. And so they have even said, I've listened to Des Linden's podcast, about how how it gives them context, right? Like to feel that they are one of 30,000, mm. right? And that's inspiring them to them to see all these people too. And, you know, it's all these little moments, right? It's it's a great experience. I highly recommend it. Mm. So what's next? Huh. Oh, I, oh, can I ask you another question first? Yeah. The unicorn. Can you explain yes. the unicorn? So this is called a celebration jacket. They've had, not a lot of things have changed with the marathon over the years. Um, this is one of them. Every year they have a celebration jacket and all over town on marathon weekend, you see all the different jackets from all the different years and everybody wears them proudly because it's just like, just it's like an honor to be able to wear this, right? Absolutely. And every year they're a different color, they're a different shape. Apparently this is the most recycled, recycling made, I guessed. Um, sustainable jacket they've ever produced. Um, and they always basically look the same. They always had the unicorn. And the question was, where did the unicorn come from as the mascot? It's been since day one of the marathon. And they actually don't know. They have no um, written concrete explanation for the unicorn, except for that they think it was a coat of arms of one of the original founders is where they lean to. But what they like to say is that a unicorn is a mythical, fast creature that can like like magic or something like that. And so that's why, that's what they say to this day is mm. that it's, you know. How but, old is the Boston Marathon? Oh, I Do you don't know, know that. I don't off the top of my head. It's, it, is it? It's one of the oldest. One of the oldest, yeah. 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 Hmm. What a tradition, huh? Oh, it's, I'm... Grateful to be a part of it. Mm. What advice would you have for someone who was going to think about doing a marathon? Let's do say. it. Just do it. Do yeah. it. Nothing. Get, get a coach. Nothing's holding you back mm. except for yourself. Mm -hmm. Just say it. Say it mm. out loud and do mm. it. Mm. Changes in your work life from the marathon. <laughs> I work with a great company and a great group of people, and they were so supportive. They were so incredibly supportive. Like, I'd be on a call and be like, oh, I got to go run 10 miles after this. And they'd be like, what? <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, you made it work, right? You make it work. And again, I work remote. And so that makes it easy. I work. I'm not commuting, right? right. So when I'm done for the day, I can literally walk out the front door and start running, which makes it easier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually, so since running the marathon, I've had two coworkers say, well, you know, I ran a mile. And I was like, good for you. Yeah. That's the first start. Yeah, yeah. So maybe I can uh, get and some more friends. Yeah. Running friends. <laughs> nice. Do you have a, when's your preferred time to run? Morning, afternoon, night? I love to run at like dusk. Mm. I love the sunset. I'm driven by the sun. The sun fuels me. So if the sun, especially like as I, I don't like blaring sun, like I'm the one at the beach with the long sleeves and the pants and the big sun hat. But at dusk, that's that's golden hour. That is truly special. Mm. Yeah. Anything else about the experience you want to pass along mm. that we haven't talked about? The I can't think of anything. Mm. I just, I'm just so grateful. I'm, I'm grateful. I would like to say just, just another thank you to all the people who let me share their stories. They gave me so much fuel. And, you know, we cried on the phone together. And, you know, those, that moment that people gave, those moments that people gave up to, to share with me and to share personal stories and hard stories and funny stories and, I just am so grateful for that. It made this experience, it made the experience really, truly special. Mm. I, I meant to ask earlier, how did you incorporate those people into the actual run? I had on my singlet, on my Dana-Farber singlet, 
I had all their names written on my back, including the four victims of the marathon bombing. Um, and then I, um, the day before the race, Dana Farber uh, has this um, set up where you can write why you're running. And I wrote all their names on that as well. Mm, nice. Nice. Well, what an experience. What would you, if somebody was going to jump into Boston, what would you tell them to do? Other than, other than just do it, um, get get a, get a coach, get a plan, and just make it happen. Call me. Yeah, great. Text me. Yeah. How do we do that? How do we, <laughs> how do we get in touch with Reach Dina? out to me on Facebook. Yeah, yeah. You know, just okay. like, it's a small community, mm -hmm. right? Like, everybody kind of knows everybody. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's grab a coffee. And, you know understand like i'd love to talk to anybody about it right like what motivates you cuz it's hard and you need to be motivated and you need a support system so. yeah yeah you you've made it sound pretty easy it it is a lot of hard work and dedication and i think people can read between the lines that that's all true but i must admit the way you did it you certainly make it sound pretty easy <laughs> <laughs> but that's who you are and that's awesome so I think we're going to have to do another time where we can talk about your your other life, your work life, because that's pretty fascinating what you do to bring content uh, to students who are online. Yeah, the goal is just to improve learner outcomes. Mm. That's really it's really what you do, and it is it's it's fun. Mm, great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And, this was uh, fantastic. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting me yeah, share. Yeah, yeah, I think it's super inspiring. Yeah. Oh. And and not just the running part because just inspiring us to do things, be a difference maker, encourage others to be better. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Dina. Thank you. Yeah.